Thanks for the introduction. So today, it's working. Yes. So today I'm going to talk about how we're going to monitor the size, uh, monitor the food injection by using the food waveform inversion. And I'm going to particularly talk about this particular uh, fluid on the right hand side. And in, we're going to inject into somewhere near the Tokyo. I'm going to come back to the picture in a few moments, uh, in a few slides. So this is basically not nutshell of this presentation. Once you understand this picture, you understand everything in my presentation. So the top one is if we do the velocity inversion, which we look at it, our Earth by using the conventional travel time tomography, you see some structures there, but it's very smooth. The second one is you move from the conventional travel time tomography to what I do, Hoover form inversion, you see how clearly we see the layering structure and all the details. The last one is once we use, once we got this one and we try to see the velocity changes in the earth, then you can see some transient changes as we see in the bottom. So I'm gonna come back, I'm gonna talk about this later extensively. So before we move on to time lapse stuff, let's go back to a very basic um, fluid form inversion. So here I'm showing the ocean bottom seismograph survey data acquired by the control source near the size, uh, near, uh, near Japan, it's called Naga Subduction Zone. So this data is showing a lot of traces from left hand side to right hand side at particular okay, at particular ocean bottom seismograph. So the top, the vertical axis is time, so you see that uh, waves arrive at a certain time and going down. So you see a lot of details, and also when you go to the file set, you see another detail. So what we're gonna do with this data, the early thing, very easy thing to think about is when the, the wave arrives, going to tell you how fast it travels in the Earth. So we use the travel time and image the subsurface. So the objective function is the difference between the travel time of your observation and your calibrate from your particular model. So that's going to be E, I, top, I, I write at the middle. And by doing that and iteratively updating, you get the structure like this. So subduction plate is coming from the right hand side to the left hand side. You kind of see the subducting plate here. So that is the information when we use just the one point of the data. So basically you are only using this part. But which the change, but when you look at the data, you see a lot of different arrivals. So you see the shape of the waveforms and also the three arrivals probably in the water, and that's gonna to go to the light angle reflections and refractions, and we see some of the reflection data too. So it's rich in the data, so why don't we use this? That is a concept, that is the idea and motivation which drive us to use a full reform inversion. Okay. <laughs> so, this I think I misspelled, but when we go to the travel time from the travel time tomography to waveform inversion, we compare the waveform itself. So this is still spelled like a T, but it's supposed to be T. So we are comparing the data itself, just not the first level. So comparing with the previous one I showed you earlier, this is the travel time tomography model, and this is full waveform inversion model. You see the wave, uh, this is actually uh, like it's along the left hand side, from the right to left hand side, and on top, you see the underlying sediments too, as shown as a low velocity design. And this also shows some of the seismogenic fault here, so we can actually interpret a lot more compared to travel time tomography. So that is our travel time tomography model, and that is our fluid form inversion model. So, what we are capturing by using the full waveform inversion. The top one observed data from the Nakai subduction zone. And the left hand side is a travel time. So the left hand side, if you use a travel time tomography model, you see the smooth model and try to recreate what the waveform should look like, this is what we get. You see these yellow ones are travel time picks we usually get and how smooth the structure gives you the smooth waveforms. But when you compare this with the up top figure, you don't really see the details of the waveform. By using full waveform inversion, we can actually improve and we can reproduce the details of the waveform. The right hand side, you see a lot of details, particularly these 
wide angle refractions that are well reproduced. By using fluid form inversion, we can actually open up a lot of, uh, lot of the subsequent uh, studies. Here is an example. Again, we are showing the field travel time tomography model on the left top. And left bottom is high resolution P wave velocity model we got from the full wave form inversion. And right one, as I showed you earlier, as I mentioned earlier, that you can get a structure interpretation, more detail. And also, we can use the um, experiment, rock, experiment and rock physics to convert from P wave velocity model to detailed uh, stress state and pore pressure estimation. So now what we have been talking about is the capturing the static Earth. So right hand side is showing some schematic vertical section of the Earth. We drill two wells and we put source on the left hand side and right hand side we put the receivers. We repeat this procedure to capture the structure between, basically more approved, probe the more, uh, structure between these two. So that we call a cross world survey. So when we do this, we can actually get a seismic record as we are talking. And what we want to do is from the seismic record to the static distribution of elastic earth that we already discovered, discussed. Now we want to move on from just a static distribution to time dependent elastic parameters. So for example, if you drill the wells between these two wells, then you can get, so this is our well, and if you inject the fluid, you're going to change the elastic parameters near the well. So we repeat the survey during the injection or after the injection, then you can get the structure, you can get a waveform that snapshot each time of the Earth. <coughs> so left hand side, before the injection, we call the data baseline. And once we start the injection, we call the data as monitoring one to monitoring n. So what we want to do is from these monitoring data to capture time-dependent elastic parameters. So what is the month's first difficulty we're going to face is these injection typically don't introduce a lot of changes in the dead board. Here I'm showing on the three curves at the bottom, those are traces from one particular survey at a different time. So black one is before the injection, before we see any changes in, we basically create any change in Earth. But once we inject, that's gonna be gray and another light gray. You see the changes mostly in the amplitude and shape of the waveforms, but you don't really see the change in the time difference a lot. So to capture the difference in the waveform, uh, to capture the difference in the Earth, we need to use the waveforms rather than the travel time information. So this is another reason we want to use the fluid form inversion for the time lapse, uh, the time lapse monitoring. <coughs> so what going to be the challenges we're going to face in the time lapse if we are in on top of small signal? Basically, the waveform changes we observe. There are going to be two errors which we need to and we basically need to talk, think about. So this is the left, the equation shows the left hand, left hand is our estimated velocity change between monitoring data and the baseline. And the right hand side is our true model, if you put, which we've never discovered, and what kind of error we're gonna put on top by inversion. Let's start with the last one. So when we do the acquisitions again and again, our acquisition tends not to be perfectly repeatable. We might change the source location accidentally. We might change the receiver location. We might change the source wavelet. Or we might change the coupling. Or we're going to have a different background noise. So those are going to map into the velocity change errors. And next thing is we, probe, we need to have the good background velocity model. We don't know the good background velocity model. And that's going to basically map into your velocity change estimation. So these are the three factors we want to talk and we want to minimize by either using the correct, by either using good acquisition system or either using some clever inversion method. Right. So now we're going to talk about how we do estimate a velocity change 
in the real world. So here we're going to use the microbubble water injection data. Microbubble is shown on the left hand side. And that is a mixture of the water and very small scale air bubbles. So here the air bubbles are 100 to uh, 100 millimeter, 100 uh, micrometers. So that's kind of the size. And this, basically, that is a, this is a mixture of the air bubble and the water. And the, basically, this is, has a very small amount of airs, less than one percent of the air. So the injection was done basically to prepare ourselves to CO2 monitoring in the Middle East, CO2 e water monitoring in the Middle East. That was the motivation we, they found, uh, Oregon, Oregon's industry who funded this research. Coincidentally, the muggle bubble water injection has been used or kind of considered for liquefaction mitigation in Japan. There are a couple of government funded research I found. And what their idea is basically injection a micro bubble to the shallow surface and they have the micro basically micro bubble and some particles and this in the water. During the earthquake they are find they are hoping this micro bubble will shrink or move, changes, change the change the shapes so that they can minimize the earthquake strong motion effect in situ. So the microbubble water injection we are doing was proposed for the EOR monitoring, but actually it is going to be used for the liquefaction mitigation monitoring too. So, so let me talk about where we did the survey. So survey was done in Japan in a Kanto basin near Tokyo, as I showed earlier in a cold and uncontrolled experiments, very shallow surface. We are only looking at 50 meter depths and we're going to use the shallow crosswell survey. So where we did the survey is very much densely populated area. So see, so we did the survey around here. And let's zoom out. The survey was done in the factory. The garden, basically, that is the garden type. See? And along this yellow line. So it's a very small scale survey and also very small scale data. So here is the actual system. See, we are looking at the vertical section. We drill two wells. And the left hand side again is a source well. And right hand side is a receiver well. And injection is done like 20 meters from the left hand side. We are only looking at 50 meters from the surface. Injection one um, that was done around 22 to 25 meter. Our ground wall level is 12 meter, so just above our survey. So our survey was done with piezo transducers. So three, 38 sources, very small, very small number of sources on the left hand side in one meter interval. Right hand side, they put the receivers in total 38 receivers. They are hydrophones and they are also in one meter. So you might see these are very different type of survey comparing to the previously I showed the non chirobia status survey. But when you look at the wavelengths or the size of the sensitivity kernel, they're actually not that different. Left hand side is a sensitivity kernel for the non chirobia data. You see, you see the fat curve. So right hand side is a current study sensitivity kernel. They also pretty much fat. There are different service, different service scale, but when you look at the wavelength scale, from the wavelength perspective, they are not that different. <coughs> so we back to acquisition survey, and I'm going to talk about how we did the source. They use a pseudo-random sweep, instead of the standard uh, explosive type. So wavelength, the actually injected wavelength look like left hand side. You see. But you see the curvature, sine curve, with the different polarity flips. It's like a vibrocyte source, but vibrocyte source, you change the frequency, motion frequency along the survey, but here we change the polarization. By, co by using the autocorrelation, you can get our source wavelet is like a Ricoh wavelet. On top, 
they use a simultaneous technique. So excited souls from the different position for them, I think, at the same time, so that they can reduce the survey time and they can enhance the stock numbers so that we can have a good signal to noise ratio. Here, for example, this shows the three different random sweeps and they change this amplitude and they mix together, they excite together, so the receiver, you can have a mixture of the three sources effect. And after decoding, you can separate them into three. And they seem to be very small uh, close talk between the sources. So now let's look at our data. So here's the data from the short gathers. What I mean by short gathers is if you have a shot at the one certain location and receive it at the other location. So here from the left hand side, here this one panel shows one particular source and a lot of receivers. Source is at the 30 meter and receivers at the entire length. So the next one is source gonna be 40 meter and receiver gonna be entire depth. So what we can see from this short gather is they're pretty clean data. You see the first arrivals here really clearly, almost no, uh, no noise before. On top, the waveform is actually quite complex. You see these are reflections, but also there's some reflection going on too. So they're clearly identifiable, and we're very happy to see the data. And bottom one, you can see the spectra. The spectra is actually high frequency. You see from the 500 hertz to 1.5 kilohertz. That's our data. Okay. So what we're seeing here is the P wave arrivals. So if you're curious about knowing S wave arrivals, you also want to know if we can use elastic formulation. So we try to find S arrivals. Here is the same gather again, but from the, uh, what we are showing before, was just up to 60 milliseconds, but we tried to see the later arrivals. So if the P wave comes around 50, 40 seconds, 40, 50 seconds, then we would expect to see the S wave arrival at 100 milliseconds, and we see nothing. So the source is actually meant to be more piezo type source, so pre a pressure source, that's also why, and you see this. Uh, you see our traces, and we actually cannot really find S. So we focus on the P wave arrival and acoustic implementation. So we look at the different domain too. The receiver gather means we're going to fix the receiver and there are going to be a bunch of resources. So we see the same characteristic as the short gathers. We see the clean error and clean signal and a lot of scattering and reflection and diffraction going. So we are very happy to see that consistency between the salt gathers and the cedar gathers. So how they, how they did injection and the monitoring? They first did the baseline survey 10 days before the start of the injection. By the way, the time of the survey was May, so it's kind of warming up since. Monitoring survey, they did 14 reframing surveys over 74 hours. So here is the schedule. You see the horizontal axis as a time and vertical axis as a volume of injected microbubble water. Okay. So there is the initial, uh, there is when they started the injection, you see the injection a little bit, two surveys, and they stopped. Why they stopped, they didn't do the survey or injection during the, during the evening. So that is evening. And once the morning time, they started the injection again, and they did one, two, three, four, five surveys, and stop, and inject, stop. So it's quite freaking survey, so we can hope, we are hoping to see a lot of changes. So, first thing we usually want to check is how much survey are repeatable, how much we position the source at the correct location, the same coupling and same excitation. And receiver, if the receivers are positioned properly and receivers show the proper coupling, yes? So when you change the injection, you change the pressure of the injection or just the equal pressure and then just the, the volume of the time duration? Very good question. They didn't monitor the pressure. So I don't have an answer to that. They monitored the injection volume, but they didn't monitor the pressure. So it's, very, it's a bit unfortunate not to know that. Okay. 
So, okay. so first thing we do, we're going to try to look at is how much data are repeatable. That means if the data are not affected by the injection, are they look similar or they look different? So here we are looking at the source receiver pair well below the survey look at the injection depth. So we don't expect to see the changes in the data. So right hand side, I'm showing the trace from the baseline and monitoring one, two, three, four to until 14. And if you compare these 14 lines, then can you see the difference? Not really, right? So it basically shows our data, our data are acquired in a very good manner and data show high repeatability. So if you see any changes in the signal near this uh, injection depth, then we can interpret that is a correct 4D signal or correct signal that sh basically show, basically inspected the changes in the same surface. So the next thing you want to look at is, of course, how the trace going to look like near the injection depths. Here I'm showing the trace pair from the source of receiver at 25 meter, and that's close to the injection. And right hand side, I'm showing a very similar picture, the very uh, same type of picture. So the zero is based on and first monitor and second monitor. So now you see the slight difference comparing to before. See? Now we see the difference in the amplitude, but not a lot. This is the thing we talk about, the change is going to be very small. If we look very closely, now we're going to see difference. So the uh, red, orange dots are what I picked as a first arrival. So you see the changes in travel time. Travel time becomes earlier. That indicates the velocity may have increased and going back to the normal. There's a third difference in the amplitude too. So we do see the changes in the waveform. This is very subtle change, but this is significant. This is um, we think that is a signal because we have a good repeatability. So the challenge in the time loss after what we talk about, we see the small signal. Although small, we see clear signal. Our um, undesired time loss data changes. We confirmed our data equation is nearly perfect. So that's going to be very small. So what we're going to do with the imperfect background velocity model knowledge. So we're going to do the Fourier form inversion to get the background velocity model, first of all. So again, this is our observed short gather on the top. Now I only see that every other shot together, so you can see the uh, signals much more clearly. The bottom left figure is the same level gather. What I mean is a uh, shot and receiver place at the same location. So you can interpret as if the phase plane wave is probably from the left hand side to right hand side. This one is very interpretable and this is what I like. The time axis from the right to left. You see that the shallow part, arrival time is slower, that in the case of velocity is going to be slower, and it becomes faster, so that means velocity is going to increase and decrease again. And there is also you can see some reflections too. So we expect some reflectors persistent in the depth. So first thing we do is shallow time tomography always, to get the knowledge, get basically the idea of how the, how the velocity is going to look like. And this is our travel time tomography results on the right hand side. The color scale shows a 50, uh, small, slower color is blue, and warmer color <coughs> is higher velocity. <coughs> so this is where we see, and there is a higher velocity at the middle and lower velocity at the top and bottom. Now here we show the synthetic <coughs> gather computed from the right hand side picture. And you see the waveform arrives at the same near the same location uh, at the time compared to observed data, but you don't really see any complexity in we observed in the data. So now we're going to move on to Fourier form inversion. Here is what we get. This is a travel time tomography, and this is uh, Fourier form inversion. Now we see the layering structure. <coughs> Here is some low velocity structure and some two high velocity structure, very thinly layered. That's sandwiching the low velocity structure here. 
and there's going to be low velocity and some high velocity reflectors. So now I'm showing the left hand side and top hand side as a synthetic gather. So it is computed from the right hand side. And comparing to the total tone tomography, you can see how much we basically reproduced. We are adding the complexity now. Comparing this synthetic data with observed data, you see they are very similar. It's a reflection and first arrival amplitude, for example, this one looks very similar. So we basically reproduce the observed data very good. If you take the subtraction of these two, we can get the residual baseline <coughs> data. So this is our residual data. You see very small comparing to observed data. So now we are convinced that we can reduce the error due to the, um, we can probably reduce the error due to the imperfect back end velocity model. We're going to move on to estimate the time lapse velocities. Here I'm showing the baseline velocity again, that is basically pre injection. And I projected where the injection level is. And we're only zooming at the depths near the injection. So you can see that injection happens very interesting location. There are some two layers on the low velocity layer and there's some complexity going on. <coughs> so we start our time lapse uh, velocity estimation after 26 hours. So here is it how the velocity look like at 26 hours. Here is the baseline and uh, 26 hour velocity inf information inversion result. And let's take a difference between these uh, models. <coughs> and here's what we get. So now we are changing the axis to the velocity change. And you can see how small we are recovering the velocity change. This is like less than 10 meters per second. Yes? Do you directly invert for the difference in waveform or for the, you just make the difference? We make a difference. So we don't take a difference of the waveform. We are basically doing the inversion of the each monitoring time, starting from our baseline for waveform inversion result. So our data is not completely repeatable enough to take a type of difference. So this is 26 hours, and this is 28 hours. As you can see, we are actually seeing the velocity increase. We are injecting the micro bubble gas wall, micro, ga micro bubble water. And at 42 hours, we started to see some velocity decrease. And again, increase again. And a little bit decrease, a little bit increase. You know, you see some of the fluctuation in the velocity structure. And at the very end of the in injection, we don't really, see, we are starting to decrease the velocity. And at the very end, we move back almost to our starting value. So, before we, we're going to interpret this, we want to QC our waveforms. So here I'm showing the short gather again, but in a trace manner. And this is our observed data. And this is the synthetic data if we calibrate using our baseline full waveform inversion velocity model. You see they are mostly in agree they are mostly agree each other. There is some slight shift in the below uh, in this time shift and there is a lot of difference in Amplitude too. So once we do the time lapse for waveform inversion, this is our estimated sensitive data. You see, comparing to pre inversion, we actually discovered and we produced and fit our observed waveform much, much better. And this fitness really gives us a confidence to interpret the result, uh, inversion result. 
So they have done some of the trouble time study too, that's been done by the others. Right hand side is a velocity change from the trouble time tomography. They couldn't really detect changes. As you see, a lot of changes are actually in the amplitude. When they actually did a trouble time based inversion, they did an attenuation factor change estimation. Basically, how much amplitude has been attenuated, first arrival amplitude has been attenuated, they see some differences. But as you see before, those are mostly from the geometrical spreading or some uh, tuning effect in the velocity change, probably. So fluid form inversion actually combined this information and properly attached that to the velocity change. So now we want to interpret the result. Here is our velocity model again. As I told you before, we are actually injecting at a very interesting location. So when we compare that with our velocity estimation, that is increase. First thing we notice is velocity increase is actually biased towards the right hand side. And we don't really see the velocity change on the left hand side. So now we're going to interpret comparing to this one and that one. We, ex we are actually thinking this velocity structure is actually preventing to going up. That pinch out here is especially uh, important. So where, where is your injection point? Is it here the bottom mm -hmm. of the Okay, so injection point has been changed several times. They started injection at 22 meters. 23 meter, so around here. Oh, sorry, 22 meter, and they moved to 23. And in, in the end, very at the, at the monitoring schedule, uh, the injection that's going to be at the bottom. The most of the time we see the signal is the injecting from here. Another reason, another thing it puzzles us is why we are seeing the velocity increase. We are injecting water, water with a mixture of air, so we ex into the subsurface <coughs> below the water table. Our expectation was basically we're going to see the velocity decrease because we are putting water and air. We are not 100% sure, but our current interpretation one interpretation is basically this is right beneath the water table. The sun saturation might not be 100%. And now we are injecting the water, which is 99% water and just 1% of the air. So we are injecting basically the water. So instead of we decrease the saturation at the certain depth, we might be increasing the saturation. That's my interpretation. Mm -hmm. Another interpretation, we might be actually seeing the temperature increase in the water. It's known that they're heating the water at the surface, so that might be changing, that might be the reason. And that we're going to see the increase in the uh, velocity. It's still, it's very confined and right hand side to the right hand side. And it's starting to decrease at the very end. Why we are decreasing? The couple things I'm thinking of right now is that finally, once you in, uh, basically inject so much gas air, they started the air bubble becomes uh, larger, and I think uh, basically that's going to be started to reduce the velocity. So now the air uh, air effects started to kick in. So one interpretation. The other interpretation you might basically open the ray, and the uh, micro bottle <coughs> water might be escaping to the three dimensionally. Why all the changes only on the right side? So that I think we are, I think that is structure reason. The structure things are a little, if you look at the structure. So this is basically baseline model and we can interpret the structure and structure seems to be pinching out this way. That's probably why. So So this is what we found over the uh, 74 hours, which is an increase and decrease pattern. So they put the camera near the injection after finish the injection. So they, they basically drill another well on the right-hand side of the observation well, or right-hand side, so that's going to be there. 
and it actually won't they see that air is coming in, out. We don't know which direction they put the cameras in, so we don't know where, but we see the air is moving and air is still there. So, what I showed you already is basically we see the trouble time tomography is not really discovering a lot of structures, but pre the velocity, by using the fluid forming version, we can see a lot of structures, particularly these two layers, which were not known before they did the survey or the injection. And after that, with the fluid form inversion, and we discovered the velocity increase happened in a very confined mean, confined manner, in one to two meter between two <coughs> layers. And that, that the percentage change is going to be less than 1%. So it's interesting, it's very important to do the fluid form inversion because then you can actually use this structure to interpret what's going on. Otherwise, we wouldn't know this is actually confined in these two layers. So, okay. so there's a lot of mysteries, actually a few mysteries we are still having, and that's I want to share. So first thing is, we do have some in interpretation, but why do we see velocity increase during the survey? Our interpretation is we are increasing saturation at the depths, but maybe there is some other potential uh, reasons. <laughs> The answer is why does velocity study to recover to the velocity value, based on velocity values, even though we are still keep injecting water, microbubble water. So that thing is still very mysterious, and if anybody has any idea, I'm very happy to talk about it. So what we showed your result is after 26 hours. So the question is, what happens before that? Why we are not using this, and nobody noticed before, but why? So I'm going to show you the data, and data is very interesting. <coughs> so here I'm showing the baseline data again, and this is the CBIC acid. And once they started to inject, this is one hour the injection, we see the significant change in the waveform. Our expectation, again, is that we are injecting the air, we're going to see high frequency attenuation. What we see here is we're actually losing the low frequency end. That's obvious when we see the waveform, that seems a lot of vibration. And when you see the spectra, you see a lot of loss. Let's compare, again, with baseline data. Here's baseline data and one hour. And that happens around injection and also some below. First instant we saw this, probably something wrong with the acquisition. Maybe some, somebody skewed up the receiver. So here is how the spectra and waveform actually look like. Left hand side is an affected trace, basically far from the injection. Blue is a baseline letter and orange is one hour. You see the repeatability is very good. They are coherent, they are very consistent. Once you see the affected trace on the right hand side, you see the difference. There's a lot of difference in the waveforms. At the same time, you see spectra changing. Frequency has been lost, and there's some notch. That's one interpretation. So we want to understand this is aggression problem or it is actually phenomenal. If you look at the uh, data from the different time, so again, this is one hour after two hours of the injection. You see comparing to before, something started to change. So it started to heal, the velocity, the frequency change started to heal. So this is before and this is after. This is second two hours. And once you go to 18 hours, frequency spectra through the heels. And it's very consistent manner and study from the bottom to top. So we think that is physical, not aggression problem because that's so consistent. And also they are putting away the receiver array all the time. So that shouldn't be some receiver problem. So this is 25 one more hour, and you only see this portion. And this is 23. 
and at 26 it started to heal and after that we don't really have that phenomena anymore so they're really consistent that shows that basically this phenomena happens on the early stage of the injection and we're not sure why it happened yet so if you do have seen any similar thing before that would be great let me know and if you know why that would be more great <laughs> then we can write one more paper a little bit and this is 15 hours so you see these are not really different so that also showed that we are using this portion of the data to fully form inversion so that also confirms our we are basically using the portion we can probably explain by the elastic theory so that's 272 hours there okay so that's 74 and again this is my conclusion slide so thank you very much for your listening i'm happy to take questions possibility is that it increase the velocity is that when you injection putting the water into the and you increase the pore pressure. Mm -hmm. If the volume of the uh, the pore porosity is not changing very much and then the skeleton is under increase of the pressure. When the skeleton is kind of uh, price the density increase. Okay. Uh, if the wave is uh, really kind of uh, propagated through the skeleton and then that increase the, uh, the, 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 the velocity, it's one possibility. So I'm thinking. But another thing that you emphasize the uh, air bubble. The point is, the air bubble will get into injected, usually they're going to get it together to, to form a big pocket. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I don't know if the air bubble really can really distribute and uh, evenly and then uh, to, to increase the, the migration or the, the, the percolation, something like that. Yeah, I'm not sure either, but they're using the Michael bubble, basically that small particle that's going to avoid the concatenation possibly, but I'm not sure that's going to be another possibility. Yeah. It's a, a very nice study. It looks like very good quality data. Um, I wonder about uh, water tables. It's a phrase, it's a very comfortable phrase, uh, but over a 24-hour period where we're injecting into unconsolidated material, uh, it may be changing. Fluid level in two wells should be visible in autocorrelation, uh, particularly receiver well. We should see autocorrelations give a nice picture of does the fluid level in the receiver bowl, bowl will change. Could we be seeing an artifact of a changing scattering mm -hmm. from water table that masquerades as something uh, happening at, at, at depth? Um, I don't think so. Like water table fluctuates very, water table, I said the water table 12 meter is coming from the observation when they put the receiver up and source array. They, when they put the resource and receiver array, they, that's where they think that where the water table is. Do you see scattering from water table? I do see the reflection from the water table in the data. And does it change? I'm not, I haven't really changed it, checked it yet. That's going to be interesting to check it. But I think the majority of data doesn't experience that water table reflection. That's going to come later because we are looking at 12 meter, 20 meter depths. So if we go to the water table and come back, that's going to come much later, and we're not really fitting that late arrival phase yet. So that's probably not going to affect our velocity estimation change in the water in our depths, because that's significantly lower than the water table, around 10 meter deeper. <coughs> but it's going to be interesting to see the change in the water table, yes, for sure. Another question? <laughs> um, I have a question about that um, effect of liquefaction mitigation mm -hmm. that you mentioned. Um, so how far from the injection site and for how long does this effect persist? You mean like a, a mitigation site? That's not, I'm not very, very familiar with that, so I can point to the literature, but I think that's one, 
they're I'm, I saw some of the monetary study they do but they are not 100% sure where it's going uh, that's kind of one of the company actually tried to advertise that on the website too so. I have a question about why you do the full coding version, what kind of boundary condition you use because from my perspective, PML may be not very good for this case because you may have a reflection from that side out. Uh, we use a PML um, for the search uh, for the entire site and we put the PML far enough so that's not after uh, that. So, yeah. so, so your, your well is not just, just as the boundaries? No. Okay. We do take the distance. So in your plot for the Delta VP, mm -hmm. there's clearly the, the red zone in the middle, which you focus on. Um, but in the top right corner, there's sort of a velocity decrease. These levels are sort of commensurate to the amount of increase that you see, just like from the top right corner of the blue zone. Oh, you mean this part? Is that is that physically expected, or is that an artifact from FWI trying to like compensate for the travel time differences? Um, that's a very good question. We haven't. It's appearing consistently, so we ex we are thinking that it's physically plausible, but we're not sure which one it is. So we are basically avoiding that interpreting that portion. Uh, I have two questions. The first is um, you showed that after injection, the fluid moves, or at least the air bubbles move. Mm -hmm. right? And the uh, forward wave equation that you'd use for the FWR would, uh, would not take that into consideration. So I was wondering, first of all, what effect that <coughs> might have. You mean the, the first part, uh, the, the early stage of the injection? Um, well, I mean, it seems like it's still flowing even after, based on the video that you showed. Is that the case? Yeah, so that's going to be, um, so there's still movement, but uh, it's slow movement. I think we're suspecting that high pressure mm -hmm. at the early stage of the injection is probably the reason. So this is gradual move, so I don't think that's going to be affecting <coughs> at all. That's not what we need to get out of in the forward mode. Okay. And the second question is, <coughs> you discussed um, you know, possibilities about what the change in velocity meant, but it seemed like there was a change in amplitude the first two injections, I think, but not after that. So it, the amplitude increased and then it went back to what it was. I think that is particularly for that particular plot I showed you, that okay. depending on the uh, trace pair, we can see the different mm -hmm. patterns. Okay. So is, is there a reason behind that, or is that just anonymous? So that first two ones that we are, we think there is a physical reason, but we are not sure what is, <coughs> what how we can explain that, and which equation <coughs> we need to use. I'm, I'm just curious, like, is there any potential topography variations in this region, and then also this kind of uh, the, the cross section is that relative to the local surface or not? So this is uh, relative to the local surface and at least when I look at the uh, photograph I don't really see the strong uh, slope. And I did check um, is that I was expecting some of the flow going to the outer plane. I did check the local topography but it doesn't look good. Uh, sure. So when uh, after stopping the injection and uh, take a uh, time longer and longer, do you think the velocity structure comes back the original structure or still the sum the the the, the, the V remains after the once a unit after? At least the way I look at the waveform, that is right after we finish the in injection, just like seventy four hours. I mean, it's not just one hour after they finished the injection, mm -hmm. but it seems like comparing the trace before the baseline and after, they seems really close. I don't really think there is, at least from the current detection um, limit of the SWR, I don't think there is a significant difference. I have a technical question. So, mm, my question is that why you do FWI? It's, we know that it's very sensitive to many factors, and uh, I just want can you make a comment how much confidence can you 
to to have for the result because you you do because F double result is not very accurate and then you do a subtraction to see the mm -hmm. difference between two the monitors and basement mm -hmm. and uh, how much confidence you can have. That's a very good question. I think our confidence comes from the QC of the waveform. We don't have a well. Uh, if we do have a well, uh, is if they have a more data on the pressure monitoring or they did the velocity monitoring before and after using the sonic, then we would have more confidence. So our confidence is basically based from how the waveform looks same, similar, and how coherent that looks with our geological models. So that is our confidence. And also we checked quite a bit with this uh, parameter, parameterized preconditioning parameter. This one, we actually don't really need a lot of preconditioning. It's a very simple precondition. We just do the band bus filtering and the gradient masking and smoothing. Because the difference, the difference like less than one percent. And uh, did you check during the after do you, do you check the difference between each iterations and yes. Each yes. Yeah. A quick question. Do you have any kind of uh, hydrological data that can really be referenced then and to, to, to help you to interpret the result. The only thing we have is a volume injection, so we don't really have... You don't have the uh, hydrological uh, survey before in this area. Because from a hydrologic point of view, underneath the water table and uh, between the uh, aquifer, there will be kind of a barrier, and that which has very poor quality for filtration of the, the water downwards. So when if your injection happens to near the barrier layer, and so you may destroy the barrier, and so that really just let you go horizontally, is that something like that? This is another interpretation, something. Thank you very much. Uh, last question. Uh, is your forward model uh, 2D or 3D? It's a 2D acoustic. Uh, that means you have to align the injection uh, source and receiver uh, yeah. within a single plane. Yes. Is it also the case uh, in reality? So this case is actually, the reality is they basically planned for this one, so they put the injection well at the, at, along the line. So that's in for the same plane. All right, let's thank our speaker again. And if you want to talk to Ray, her office is on the, on the third floor. Thank you very much.